so glad you're with us online. We're waving at you. We're waving at you. We're so glad you're hanging out with us today. We're glad all of you are in the house as we've been in this series called Together the Values that unite us. My goodness, it is so great to see some faces in the room. That's been a minute, man. I just love our spiritual family. I just love, I love, man. There, I, I'm sorry, this isn't in the script, but there's just some people that I have missed. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some of you online right now. Comment and let us know that you're with us online right now. But there's also some great many new faces that have just been away for a season. Can we give those people, they're on site today. Can we give them a round of applause? It's so great to see them today. If, you, if it's been a minute and you're here today, give me a hug. Or wait, no, no, don't do that. We'll, we'll give a distance hug. I don't know. Do whatever you feel comfortable with. I, I'm just, man, it just makes my heart happy. It was 1949 in China when Chairman Mao, by one report, gave an order to one of his colonels. The colonel was to go throughout China and to squash any insurrection, any threat against communism. As the colonel would go around, he was to use whatever measures necessary to make sure that, that no uprising would occur, specifically no threat against communism, namely Christianity. And so as history records this this colonel would go from province to province area to area and, and finally he made his way up to northern China where he heard of a, a village, a city, a community that um, was radically transformed by the saving power and grace of Jesus Christ and he had to do something about it it was literally his job description to do something about it and so he made his way up to that community and he found out through a series of questions and investigations that it seemed to be one man was largely responsible for a whole city, a whole community coming to faith with Jesus Christ. And that man was one of my spiritual heroes. His name's Watchman Nee. The colonel continued to ask questions, find out more about this Watchman Nee, this, this man who had told the community about the life-saving power of Jesus Christ and they'd all come to faith in him. And, and he started to walk into the city and he found out more information as he asked more questions. He, he also found it that that Watchman was actually appointed by some reports as, as, as like the mayor, the community leader of the city. And so this made him even more indignant, the colonel even more indignant. I've got to squash this by any means necessary, even if it means the loss of Watchman Nee's life. I will do whatever is need, needed for the party. And in doing so, he, he started to ask people within the community, hey, could you please point out to me the mayor of the city, this, this Watchman Nee, and everyone, when they would respond to his question they did with love and affirmation. Oh, the great, the watchman knee. Oh, they, 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 they seemed to care for him very deeply. And they started to point out where watchmen would be. Getting in the general area, the man asked another person, where, could you please point out watchman knee, please? And a young man pointed to an older gentleman, uh, well, middle age, more exactly, uh, pushing a wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow filled with manure. And, and, and he would notice that this man would take the wheelbarrow of manure from one place to the next and then take a bunch of manure out of it and, and, and work on the community garden and do what needed to be done. And, and he would take that wheelbarrow back to the manure pile and go through his motions again, filling it back up over and over and over again back to the community garden getting his hands dirty dealing with the manure pile what was really interesting was as the person pointed out this man the colonel said there is no way that this could actually be 
wash my knee. For no, for no mayor would actually push around a wheelbarrow full of manure. There's just, there's absolutely no way. So the colonel started his investigation more and he went to another person and said, could you please point out to me Watchman Nee? Again, that, that other man pointed him back to the man pushing the wheelbarrow. And this went over and over and over again. And, and the colonel was just blown away as a high leader in the communist party. This is not how leaders act. Finally, he just got exhausted. He's like, well, I'll just ask anyway. So he goes up to the man pushing the wheelbarrow and says, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you please point me out? I'm looking for a man by the name of Watchman Nee. The man responds, I am who you're looking for. I'm he. The colonel was really kind of blown away. And he said, I I don't understand, sir, for, for you are indeed the community leader, the mayor of this community as well. Are you not? He said, yes, yes, I am. He said, well, the, the party ranks that I'm, I'm affiliated with, no one would do this kind of work. We order people to do this kind of work. It's, I, I'm sorry, can you just explain? I, I don't understand. And the spiritual giant, Watchman Nee, looked back at the man and said, these people have made me their leader. And so I have become their servant. One report says that this colonel not only eventually became a Christ follower because of the example of Watchman Nee, but later was executed, was killed for his own belief in the faith by the political party as his family watched. At Cross Church, the values that unite us. At Cross Church, we're wheelbarrow people. We're wheelbarrow people. We, at Cross, we serve selflessly. This is a value that unites us. This is a, a value of, of servanthood. Jesus Christ actually put a different name, a different spin on it. He says we're, we're people of the towel. We're servants. We wash the feet of those around us, even though it's not always so glamorous. You know, if I didn't share that opening story, you would probably answer with a different response. But let me ask the question first. The question is, if I were to ask you what is the greatest position a Christian can have, what would it be? If I asked you what is the greatest role that a Christ follower can possess, what would that be? look like. Again, we know where I'm going because of my opening story, but most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we might say, well, you know, as I read the Bible, apostle's a pretty high title. I mean, wasn't Paul that guy or or Peter that guy, apostle or pastor, teacher, some sort of leadership, whatever. If, If we would step back from giving spiritual answers and we gave real ones, that's probably what we would say, right? I mean, I've read about all these bigwigs in the Bible, these people that wrote all this stuff. Apostle, he would be a significant leader in all this. And, and that's great, but that's not the right answer. See, the apostle Paul and most of the other apostles actually give us the answer. It's not apostle, it's servant. We know the answer because of the opening line, but I want you to check it out and I want you to see something that maybe you've never seen before. If you open up your Bibles to Romans 1.1, Paul, the apostle, opens with this line. His very first words as he writes the legendary book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the Romans, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Notice that Paul says, hey, I'm going to tell you what I'm called to do. I'm called to be an apostle. But even more than that, first he says who he's called to be. See, the apostleship came out of his servanthood. He says, more than anything, I'm a servant. Now check this out. This is a crazy trend. If you ever look at the open, the first verse of countless, many um, passages, many um, books in the Bible, check this out. Philippians 1.1 starts like this. Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus. 
Oh, we're not done there. Let's go to James 1.1. 1, 1. Right at the beginning, James. You know the stepbrother of Jesus? This guy grew up with Jesus. So if there's anybody that's not going to show authority under someone, I'm saying stepbrother is going to back up a little bit. And he says this, James, I am James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. How about 2 Peter? Let's talk about Peter right now. You know, he was kind of a big wig in the church. He says this, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, right at the beginning, hey, we're putting out our business cards first for everyone to see. He says, Simon Peter, a servant first, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, all the big wigs, they throw out their business cards and they say, you know what? Let me tell you where I stand first. I am a servant See, at Cross Church, we serve selflessly. The highest calling, the highest position for Christians is to be a servant. But I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in titles, right? We get so wrapped up in positions and callings. Well, pastor, that's just, this is just what I'm gifted to do. And these are the things that I'm really good at. And, and that's great. Your giftings, your callings, your talents, your abilities. We want, we want to see God use those at Cross Church and in our community. We want to release you to lead. That's a big deal. But if that's all that you will do, well, I'm not called to do that, Pastor. That is not my title. That is not my position. I am not truly gifted in that area. If that is all you ever will do, you will miss what God really wants for you because you're caught up in roles and titles and not servanthood. At cross, we serve selflessly. Your primary position as a believer, believe it or not, is to serve. And if serving is beneath you, then spiritual leadership is beyond you. It just is. For me, for each and every one of us, Jesus states in Matthew, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They, they, they don't push wheelbarrows. They just don't. It's, it's beneath them. And, and their high officials exercise authority over them. They order for them to push the wheelbarrow. Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus shows us that greatness is found in servanthood. When I think about greatness, I think of two other greats that Jesus gave us instruction about. One was known as the Great Commission, and the other one was known as the Great Commandment. The Great Commission was go into all the world and, and make disciples. It was Jesus' final instructions for you and for me, what we're supposed to become. He's like, hey, I want you to become disciples. I want you to become more like me. And then the Great Commandment is, hey, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greats. If you want to be great, we should follow these great instructions. And what I found is that we will either become consumed by God's commission or we will become a consumer Christian. We will either be consumed by these greats, by these commissions, or we will become consumer Christians. What do you mean, Josh, consumer Christians? Well, consumer Christianity, I think, is something we must all guard against, starting with this guy who's talking right now. It's where our level of personal engagement in church or with God is based upon our perceived personal benefits from church or from God. Our engagement is based upon our perceived level of benefits from God or the church. We treat God like our culture treats the marketplace. If it benefits us now, we keep it, we buy. But if it doesn't, we drop it, we sell it. We get out of there as fast as we can. Slowly over time, without, often without realizing it, we become more and more focused on a what's in it for me mentality instead of following the biblical mandate to become disciples of Jesus Christ, to become more like him. For those of us that have um, done this Christianity, followed Jesus Christ for a while now, I think this is exceptionally hard for most of us. I think we're the ones that are more likely to fall into consumer Christianity trap than, than those who have just newly started in their spiritual walk. And, and let me give you an example of why. 
I want you to think about the disciples. You know, you know the, the OG, the original gangsters that followed Jesus, right? There's 12 of them, and then one got, got out. But anyway, uh, well, then it became 12 again later, but it, immaterial. So bottom line, these 12 guys are hanging around Jesus. They're doing their thing every single day. And you think that if I'm close to Jesus every single day, I get more godly. I mean, literally, I'm walking next to the dude every single day. That's pretty, that's pretty incredible, pretty primo. And what ends up happening is after about three years of this, we don't see more humility come out. We actually see the opposite. We see consumer Christianity. Because what ends up happening is they start getting in all these little side bickering fights about who's going to have the primo seat next to Jesus in heaven. Who's going to get the ultimate benefit, the ultimate title, the ultimate position, the ultimate role in heaven. Who's going to get that spot? And, and they're bickering and they're, and they're biting each other and they're fighting about this whole thing and, and, and it's going on back and forth and Jesus kind of gets ticked off at this moment and, and that's where it kind of goes to this whole idea of servanthood. He, he addresses it with servanthood. See, if consumer Christianity can affect the disciples who daily walked with Jesus, what about me? What about us? So how do we break the spiritual me first mentality? Servanthood. Servanthood. God's greatness always comes through servanthood. You see, the only way we can fulfill the great commission and the great commandment is to serve others selflessly. The only way you will ever fulfill the great commission, the great commandment is to serve. And and, an opposite is also true. You won't fulfill the great commission, the great commandment, when you don't serve. When, when we make it all about consumer Christianity and what, what's it benefiting me, then we actually don't fulfill the great commission and the great commandments. We are not great in the king's eyes because we've made it about ourselves. When our default becomes to serve others instead of trying to be served by others, our church experience changes. Our relationship with God in a positive way, it, it changes. See, God wants to fill us up, but it can only fill up those who are poured out. Like like a like an offering, like a uh, King David actually did this. He poured out some water that was brought to him from a a special well, and, and he poured it out as an offering to God. And here's what I've learned that only those who are poured out can God refill. But God doesn't waste himself. If you're wanting a new anointing, if you're wanting a new freshness from God, God only fills up those who pour themselves out. And so often we're, we're, we're spiritual consumers. We're filled to the brim and we're wondering why we're not getting anything new from God. What happens with water when it just sits there, completely filled to the brim, but not being poured out, not being used? Eventually it becomes stagnant, becomes dead. It, it's just a byproduct. Without water being used, without water being recycled, it being poured out and then refilled, it eventually becomes stagnant. And most of us... It becomes very easy, like me, like you, to live in this pattern of stagnation because we're scared to pour ourselves out. We're scared to serve. Laying down his life, Jesus refused to make faith only about what was in it for him. His lifestyle rejected this concept of consumer Christianity. He showed us that greatness is not to be found in, in accumulating, spiritual, accumulating spiritual experiences or demanding one's rights but rather sacrificial obedience to the Father. Spiritual experiences. <laughs> have you heard recently? Maybe you have. I know I'm guilty of this. We've made a shift in our society anymore. We don't, we don't collect stuff. We, we give experiences. We create moments. And I'm, I, I do this as well, too, with my kids. It's like, well, we don't want to just give them more stuff. You know, we, we're, we're not going to give them any more presents for Christmas or any stuff. We're going to make some memories. We're going to do some stuff. We're not, we're not creating an experience. That sounds great. I mean, it's, it's fine. I'm sure part of the heart's right. But oftentimes, all we're doing is we're just shifting greeds. It's still greed. It's just disguised in a different way. And, and what, what happens now for a spiritual consumer is... Well, no longer, we're, we're collecting these spiritual experiences, these spiritually goosely bumps moments. And if we don't get enough of them, well, then I'm just going to go over and get a different experience somewhere else. Because we become spiritual consumers and, and, and it can become very, very dangerous. And the book of John gives this stunning example of, of sacrificial obedience through servanthood. 
in, in Jesus' final hours. And, and what's sad is I'm about to read to you a verse that most of us in the room, and if you haven't heard this verse, I am so thankful that you're here. I'm so thankful that you're watching this. If you've never heard this, I'm, come on, so thankful you're here. Big deal. But the sad reality is most of us, the moment I start reading this verse, we're like, yeah, I heard it, check out. But as a pastor, I think one of my most beautiful challenges every single week is I just want to remind you, I want to remind you, I want to remind you so that we can move forward together. It's not about what's new that's said, it's what's reminded that we start living now. And it says this, final hours before Jesus' crucifixion, John 13, four through five. And so Jesus got up from his meal and he took out his outer clothing. Wait, 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 wait. So he got up from his meal. How many of us, man, this will preach right here, we are still stuck stuffing our faces spiritually that we don't have enough time to get out of our meal and start serving others. I mean, think about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus got up from his meal. But some of us are just sitting down like, feed me more, pastor, feed me more. Let's go into the deep things of God. Don't you understand that the deep things of God are given away, they're not received? Fact. Fact. Great theology right there. The deepest things of God are never collected. They are given away. They are poured out. They are sacrificial. Those are always the deepest things from God. And so Jesus, he got up from the meal. He took out his outer clothing, meaning he separated himself from his identity. Clothing was often resembling some form of identity or royalty or rank or position. And he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What's crazy is this, this humbling experience that many of us know the story of for Jesus uh, broke really some major cultural stereotypes on what faith should resemble. The Midrash, which was an early Jewish commentary, first and second uh, AD, on what Hebrew scripture meant. It was the interpretation, it was the exegesis, if you will, of scripture, uh, taught that no Hebrew, even a slave, could be commanded to wash feet. And this is exactly what Jesus does. He commands us to serve, commands us to wash feet. You know, in some denominations, it is their spiritual practice to wash feet. Like, as much as some of us take communion or we baptize up, in some denominations, it is the regular practice spiritual ordinance to wash others' feet. I'm not asking for all of you to do this for me next week. And I will not be doing this next week for all of you. <laughs> Some of you are like, Pee-wee, why? It's incredibly humbling. It's, uh, I've been a part of it many times in my life, and it's very humbling. But more than just even the act, I think God wants us to live a lifestyle. Jesus was modeling to Christ followers that selfless servanthood was the framework that the Son of God would model. While consumer Christianity makes demands, Jesus laid down his life for the church and asked you and I to do the same. When we encourage someone to serve around here and do something out in the community, to serve in the community, it's not simply because we, we have all this work to do and we, man, we really need some volunteers. We really need to get your work done. We really need some help around here. Believe it or not, there are a lot of things that our staff could do without you. Yeah, we'd have to work a little bit harder. And truthfully, sometimes it's harder for us to ask for people to serve than it is to just get our staff to do it. But why do we open up opportunities to serve? Let me tell you why. Because it changes our heart. That we understand that we will only be as big as our service. We will only be as big as our serve is. And so as a church, we are committed to serve selflessly. And so when we provide opportunities for serve, it's not because we can't get it done in our own time. Though sometimes it is hard. It would be more challenging. But we understand that the pastors are not the ultimate leaders of the church. The servants are. The servants are. Because that's how Jesus modeled his life. And that's who we are at Cross Church. At Cross, we serve selflessly. Jesus put it this way. 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? This verse talks about self-denial. It outlines a planned attack against consumer Christianity, loss of life. Loss of life for Christ's sake to provide a fullness in life. However, when one begins to go after all the world and all that it demands, all that it offers, the final, re- the final result for them will be great loss, even loss of their own soul. My friend Mark Batterson puts it this way. He says, if Jesus hung on his cross, we can definitely carry ours. And that isn't just our greatest responsibility. It's our highest privilege We don't come alive in the truest and fullest sense until we die to self. (laughs) When we learn what it means to serve selflessly, it moves us into our next cross value. At cross, at cross, we resolve personally. At cross, we resolve personally. What does this mean? Life is full of tension points. Have we not figured this out, right? It's full of tension points, and that's natural. But dealing with them head on in a humble and holy way, that's supernatural. Instead of gossiping about another or backbiting, we practice Matthew 18. You might take time to unpack it and read it a little bit later. That says that when you have a problem between you and someone else, you go and you meet with them and you work it out just between the two of you. Just between the two of you. You don't bring everybody else into your drama. You don't bring everybody else into your problem. You don't talk about that person and what they did to you. You work it out just between the two of you. This speaks of how to deal with an offense or a hurt. Most of us get offended, and it really is easy. I think we've all been there. We've been hurt or offended when we think that we shouldn't have been treated a certain way. But check this out. It's hard to an offend. It's hard to offend a servant of God. It's hard to offend a servant of God because a servant doesn't put their rights and their feelings first for they understand that they are a servant. A true Christian response is maybe that person is having a rough day. You know, the one that just offended me or hurt me or said that thing. Maybe they're just having a rough day today. Or, or maybe, maybe I didn't quite hear them the way they meant to say it. Or maybe they just had some bad pizza. Maybe they're a little hangry. Or, 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 or maybe, maybe I don't see the full picture. And what is the response of a mature believer? I'm going to go to that person. And as Matthew 18, I'm going to work it out just between the two of us. I'm going to say, you know what? There's something funky going on between the two of us. And I'm, in a humble way, I'm going to come before them and I'll say, hey, can you help me out with what's going on? Did I do something to just hurt your feelings or, or what's going on right now? I love to get this worked out just between the two of us. At cross, we resolve personally. A command from God, I think, that should be in there is thou shalt not triangulate. Meaning I don't have to bring in a third party to always fix this. I I, I can go directly to the source, directly to the person and and deal with what's going on. I don't have to bring in the innocent and make their life more messy because I am too cowardly to have Christ-like courage to resolve personally. Nobody likes conflict. So I suggest you don't go in like it is conflict. I suggest you go in humbly with a lot of prayer, saying, God, I need your help in this moment. And friend, I don't know what's going on right now, but you matter way too much for this to stand in between us. See, offenses, offended people produce fruit. Fruit like hurt, anger, outrage, jealousy, resentment, strife, bitterness, hatred, envy. Offense produces hurt. All these different things. You see, the one who resolves personally says, I will not allow a wedge of offense to come in between me or you. I'm going to be spiritually mature enough. Actually, I would say spiritually mature in the greatest extent. 
I'm going to be maybe even the more spiritually mature person to come to you first, even when it might not be my, my feeling that I should go first. You see, the one who resolves personally says, I will not allow a wedge to come between us because of a perceived or even a real offense. Ecclesiastes 7, uh, 8 through 10, a unique verse when it comes to this subject. It, it says, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Verse 9, do not hasten in your spirit to get angry or to be angry. For the anger rests, for anger rests in the bosom of fools, the lap of fools. Do not say, where are the former days? We're not the former days better than these. Do not say, oh, wasn't my relationship with this person better in the past than it is right now? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. It's not wisdom to say, well, my relationship with him in the past was good, but now it's not that great. Now, I want you to circle verse 9 if you're looking at your Bible or highlight it in your iPhone, your Android. It says, do not hasten in your spirit to be angry for angry for anger rests in the bosom of fools only fools let only a fool allows anger to rest in their laps only a fool allows anger to rest in their life and in their lap at cross we will not by god's grace live offended we won't live offended you know offense is like the bait of satan and what happens is the enemy will often cast out an offense, a problem, a trouble. And what he will do is he will slowly use it to work us away from the cross, from the relationships, from the people in our lives that we need to be closest to. And he will use that offense to lure us to a place where we are trapped and we are pulled away from the heart of the Father. The bait of Satan is living with an offended heart. That offense will continue to shift and pull you away from the heart of God. And God says, no, no, no. I don't want you to live this way any longer. I, I want you to find hope. And so I want to ask you, what kind of offense is the enemy using in your life right now to pull you away from the Father? What kind of bait, what kind of hurt has he used maybe recently or in the past that's pulling you out of relationship, out of a spiritual family right now? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we probably all could think of something. That bait of Satan is a trap. And what's crazy about the trap is that those who are offended often don't even realize that they're trapped. They are oblivious to their condition because they are so focused on what's wrong, on the wrong that was done to them, that they become, they live in self-denial. Let me put it this way. The most effective way for the enemy to blind us is to cause us to focus on ourselves. See why becoming a selfless servant, serve selflessly, is so important? Because servants don't get offended when they're treated like servants. No, listen to me, I'm not promoting abusive behavior. No, I, I won't, we're not okay with manipulative behavior or anything like that at Cross Church. Sometimes we do have to move away from relationships or people that constantly hurt us over and over again and won't allow us to heal. But 98% of the time, it's not that. Most of the time, instead of canceling out the person, we need to learn how to cancel out the offense. We just do. Our pain is due to undealt with offense in our hearts. It's no longer about the person anymore. It's more about how we've responded to that brokenness in our life. Proverbs 18.10 says it like this. It says, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Some of us have been dealing with some pain for a very long time. Someone hurts you. Someone messed you over. It was real. It, it was legitimate pain. I'm not making light of it. It was a big deal. 
And you said, you know what, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm not going to live with that any longer. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this junk any longer. I'm protecting myself. This is the right Christian response, right? I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to guard my heart. And so what we do is we start to build up this emotional wall, this callous wall of separation between us and the offender. What might have been a relationship for 5, 10, 20 years, we're now taking blocks and we're building ourselves into a fortified city, like Proverbs says. With time, what we have done is we've created a prison to our own demise. And we wonder why the world is so cold, why the world is so distant, why the world is so separated from us, and why our heart cannot heal or feel again, but it feels numb. Let me tell you the reason why. We have imprisoned ourselves. We have <laughs> surrendered the right to heal with our thought that we would protect ourselves. God says, come on, allow yourself to surrender that offense back to the Lord. I love what 2 Timothy uh, puts down and says. It says uh, in 2, 3, verses 3 through 4, you therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one entangled in warfare or excuse me, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a, as a soldier. Let me put it this way. God has a bigger mission for you, bigger mission for his soldiers than the petty affairs of living an offended life. I mean, look at the verse. It says, no one engaged in warfare. God has put you on a mission on this planet on purpose. God has said, I, I have put you here to do something divine for me. No one who's been engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Are you entangled with the offenses, with the wounds and the scars of this life? Is the bait of Satan drawing you away from the heart of God? Here's why. Believers and Christians cannot remain offended. Christians cannot remain in an offense because forgiveness is the epicenter of the Christian life. Forgiveness is the epicenter of the Christian life. Check out this verse, Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. Get rid, get rid, get rid. Cut the cord of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I want to be a just as Jesus to them, as Jesus was to me. I want to be a just as believer. You understand what I'm saying right now? I, I, I want to be just as Christ to them, as Christ was to me. Just as God made me a just as follower, disciple of Christ. Disciples of Jesus Christ cannot build walls. They cannot follow bait away from the Lord. God, God, make me a just as believer to you. When one is offended, often we're waiting for that other person to make it right with us. We're wanting them to come back and to fix the mess that they've made, right? Think about it. We're wanting them to serve us and to make it right instead of us serving them we ourselves we start to see ourselves as the master and them in a sin debt towards us but again the posture of the believer is to serve others even when they are wrong this is so countercultural isn't it just as christ god forgave me you, each of us. What is the outcome of when we serve selflessly and resolve personally? What is the outcome of these first values? We serve selflessly. We resolve personally. We, we blend beautifully. This is the outcome. This is at cross. At cross, we, we blend beautifully. One thing I genuinely love about cross church is our racial diversity. I love it. I think it's a beautiful mark of our church. We blend beautifully at Cross Church. Did you know that 80% of churches in America are a one-race church? 80%. Um, that's why Dr. King said the most segregated hour 
in the week is the church hour. We really do believe, though, that all ground is level at the foot of the cross, and we think cross church should start looking like heaven now. That's just who we are. That's what we believe. That's how we live. And so we want to get a head start on heaven. And that's beautifully blended. A place where not only various races blend together, but ages and genders and political persuasions and financial statuses, right? When you think about it, consumer Christianity lends towards racism, sexism, and classism as it is me-centric. Consumer Christianity takes only what is desirable from the gospel and molds it to what works best for me rather than allowing the gospel to mold me. Wow. I want the power of Jesus Christ to make me more like Jesus, not more like myself. Do you? I I want the power of Jesus Christ to make me more like him and honestly a little bit less like me. I recognize that it's only when I deal with sometimes uncomfortable conversations and get around people that don't always look like me, talk like me, think like me, vote like me, post like me, that I can grow in my faith in new ways. You can't live out the great commission and the great commandment if everyone around you is identical to you. It is absolutely impossible for you to live out the great commission, the great commandment. It is impossible for you to be a disciple of Christ. It's impossible for you to love others. If you are living just in an echo chamber, it's impossible to live out those great instructions of God. And therefore, I would say, serve others. And therefore, I would say, be great in God's kingdom. I believe the moment you meet Jesus, something shifts inside of you. Something changes in us. I also believe that reconciliation cannot be forced. It's not like some, we're going to put in some quota or something like that. I don't think we can force it. Why? Because I think that this is a hard thing. I think the only way that we'll ever see lasting change in this area is if God changes each and every one of our hearts. You see, reconciliation is what God's after. He wants our heart to be reconciled to him. And the byproduct of reconciliation with him, when things change vertically, things begin to shift horizontally. When our heart shifts with him, then our heart can start shifting horizontally with our neighbor, with our coworker, with our spouse, those who don't always look like us or act like us. This is the story of God's redeeming power. And this is the gospel. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 16, it says this. Check this out. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Time out, time out. Are you, you have lenses on where you're constantly looking at every relationship in your life from a worldly point of view. Apostle Paul says, we no longer look from a worldly point of view. We don't, we, we throw off those lenses. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in in Christ, can you say in Christ, one, two, three? If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Now, this is where we stop. We're like, new creation, I'm a new creation. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at the pastor doing a little weird dance right now. But, but, but we stop at consumer Christianity because we want to become a new cre- creation, but, but we, we put a period there. But the, the verse keeps going. It says, the old is gone, the new is here. All, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry. So because we've been reconciled to him, we've now been given a job description, servanthood, the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message, of re- the, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. As if God was making his appeal through you and me. That's what he's doing. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
in Christ, we have been adopted into a new kingdom culture. It's what this verse is saying. It's, we, don't, we don't look through the lens of the culture of our world, but, but rather now we understand that we've been adopted into the kingdom. See, in Christ, we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. What does that look like? Kingdom reconciliation has two parts. First, it reconciles people to the heart of God, like I said, vertically. Then two, it reconciles people with each other. Other, You see, in kingdom culture, in God's culture, first, people walk in a higher order of love, learning to love people who don't love them back. We are learning to love at a higher order, a higher place of love as Christ followers. And number two, in kingdom culture, people are intentional in their reconciliation. And the evangelical church, I think we've done a really good job at teaching people to be reconciled to God. But I think we've kind of done a lousy job about being reconciled to each other. Yeah. I think that's kind of the area we need to work on. If we're reconciled to God, we're going to be reconciled to each other. And all of this happens, check it from the verse, in Christ. In Christ. See, in Christ we choose kingdom culture over worldly culture. Kingdom culture over worldly culture. In Christ, we choose kingdom over politics. Kingdom over personalities. Kingdom over our past. To stay comfortable in our current earthly culture framework and try to slap Jesus on top of it at the end to justify it to ourselves actually hurts and minimizes the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is so much bigger than that. See, Jesus did not die for your cultural preferences. He died to establish the kingdom of God. He died for you and for me, the kingdom. As Christ followers, we have to understand that all earthly culture must bow its knee to the name of Jesus Christ. All earthly culture must bow its knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that culture is even my own culture, your own culture. The greatest life that was ever given to me was Jesus Christ. His blood, his forgiveness allows me now to love my neighbor, to blend beautifully, even when I don't perfectly agree with them. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, and I think that's a key word there, surrendered. If you ask yourself, have I surrendered my life to Jesus? If I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, we come to understand that God reconciles us to him so we can be reconciled to one another. Jesus Christ is our unifying factor. Nothing else will do. God made us all unique, and those differences are so beautiful. But we understand that now, once we give our life, once we surrender our life to Jesus Christ, and he becomes our king, our identity is no longer established by the personal culture that we were born into, but rather we are reconciled in Christ into a new kingdom. As Christians, we have moved from our past. We've crossed into a new kingdom, a new identity that is a son and a daughter of the Most High King. Kingdom over culture. We can now, we can can be proud of where we come from. Whether you're an American or you're African or you're Asian or Colombian. But now also the ground shaking reality is that we are reconciled in Christ. Our identity isn't defined by our sex, our age, our race, our politics, our nationality. Our identity comes from Jesus Christ alone. It's kingdom over culture. That is what you've been born into. That's what you've been saved into. That is the unifying factor that in Christ, we are made one in him. We are together. We, are, we have spiritual values and sons and daughters that unite us in him, in Christ. But Josh, it can't be that simple, can it? I mean, there's so much division. There's so much pain in our world that must be addressed. Yes, absolutely, you're right. I'm with you. But I believe, check this out, that as we live as servants, not demanding our rights, but living to serve each other selflessly, things can begin to change. And and when we serve selflessly, 
and tensions do come up and we choose to resolve personally learning to forgive each other when when there's an offense, when there's a hardship in our way, when we we learn to forgive. Because now we're in Christ, things really do begin to change. Hurts begin to heal. As our lives are reconciled, we blend beautifully. Kingdom, kingdom over culture. Father, right now, we, we come before you and and God, I think, I think we have a moment, we have a chance to respond to this message. And I think there's three simple prayers that many of us in this room, including this pastor, probably needs to pray. God, I, I pray, that, first of all, that you would teach us how to serve selflessly. If you're in this room or you're watching online and I won't embarrass you or call you out. No one looking around. And you say, you know what, Pastor, I'd like to learn how to serve a little bit more selflessly. I, I know I could increase my serve with the help of Jesus Christ. That, that thought really kind of spoke to where I'm at right now. If that's you, can you raise your hand? Your pastor's raising both of his hands on this one. God, help me to, help me to increase my serve. God, help me to learn how to sell, serve more selflessly. Slip up your hand. Just kind of wave it at me. Awesome. I think some of us also need to say the prayer, God, God, would you, would you help me to resolve personally? Some of us, there's, there's an offense that's pulling our heart away from God's heart. It's bait of Satan. It's, it's pulling us away from the relationships. And right now, if you're honest, you're thinking of an offense. You're thinking of a hurt, something that was done to you. And it probably was real, probably was very legitimate. But God says, I, I don't want that offense to, to put you in prison walls any longer. I want you to find some freedom. If you'd like to give forgiveness and give that offense back to God today, can you just slip up your hand and raise your hand with me and say, yeah, Josh, I, I need to surrender an offense right now. I just need to give it to the Lord. I just need to give to the Lord. I'm tired of holding on. Isn't it exhausting holding on to that offense? Come on, raise your hand if that's you. And, and lastly, I think for some of us in this room, um, we need to be, become a little bit more intentional about blending beautifully. And, and, and the prayer for you is, God, would you teach me to blend more beautifully? Maybe with my neighbors, my coworkers, that person that kind of gets under my skin. Maybe someone that doesn't look like me or talks like me, isn't the same age as me. God, help me to re- blend beautifully with them. If you need to be a little bit more intentional with your love, can you just put up your hand right now? I'm gonna raise my hand as well too. God, I need to be a little bit more intentional. I, I, I've been a little bit too casual. I need to be a little bit. See, the only way you'll, you'll do anything here is you have to be intentional about it. Put up your hand if that's you. God, help me to be intentional. So God, right now, I pray over all these wonderful people. God, I thank you for what you've spoken to all of us today. And God, I pray that you would very clearly help us to do one of those three things. Help us to serve selflessly. God, increase our serve. Or God, help us to learn how to resolve personally. God, if there's any offense in our heart, God, we just hand it over to you right now. God, you have forgiven us of so much. May we extend forgiveness to those around us. Oh God, teach us to forgive. And lastly, God, for some of us in this room, help us to be more intentional with blending beautifully with those around us. God, Help us to be reconciled to you and remember that you've given us the ministry of reconciliation to others. God, may we be reconcilers in your kingdom. And Father, I pray for all of us. May we continue to choose kingdom over culture. Kingdom over culture. Use us to do great things for you. In Jesus' name, amen.